Welcome to Module 4 of the Georeferencing in CCH2 training course. In this module, we will demonstrate how to use Geolocate and other tools to assign latitude and longitude coordinates and a reasonable error radius to a specimen's locality description. Please follow along in the protocol for georeferencing individual specimens. You will want to have this open and follow it closely as you begin to georeference, as there are many details covered in the protocol that will not necessarily be discussed in this training module. You can find the georeferencing protocol on the Capturing California's Flowers website. The procedures covered in this module will start on Step 8. Steps 1 through 4 were covered in Module 2, and Steps 5 through 7 were covered in Module 3. Let's start on the Occurrence Editor page of one of the specimens we found in Module 2. When we are sure that we can't import data from other records using the dupes tool, coordinate cloning tool, or coordinates that exist on the label, we can proceed to georeference the specimen semi-manually using Geolocate and Google Maps. First, click the Geolocate button to the right of the globe icon. A new Geolocate window should pop up. Make sure your browser's pop-up blocker is disabled for CCH2 if you're having trouble finding this window. Let's get familiar with the functionality of Geolocate. Geolocate is a semi-automatic georeferencing tool that will try to place a point on the map for you. You should treat Geolocate's point like an educated guess. It will often help you get in the right neighborhood, but it should not be trusted until evaluated further. Geolocate's best guess will show up on the screen as a green dot. The red dots are Geolocate's alternative guesses. To view the rationale for Geolocate's guesses, click the tab near the bottom of the window that lists the number of guesses. In this example, we see seven possible locations found. The rationale for each guess can be found after pattern. This is the text pattern that was matched to some term that Geolocate had in its gazetteer, or list of places. For example, the best guess for this locality used the pattern distance northwest of Paso Robles. This means that Geolocate recognized Paso Robles, found its center, then measured 21 miles northwest of it to place the point. We can see that Geolocate also had a couple other guesses. It recognized B Rock Canyon, which is apparently a canyon in the Carrizo Plain. If we were to decide that one of these alternative points was more appropriate than Geolocate's first guess, we can select it as the preferred coordinate by clicking on the dot either in the list or on the map. Geolocate has a number of tools that can make georeferencing a little easier. We can change the base map layer by clicking the plus sign in the top right corner, then selecting one of the base layers or overlays. This is particularly helpful when you are locating geologic features like mountains, canyons, or ridges at certain elevations. You can also measure a distance on the map by clicking the measure button at the bottom of the page. To measure, single click on each point between which you want to measure. Double click to stop measuring. You can place the marker on a new spot on the map by clicking the place marker button at the bottom of the page, then clicking on the map. Now that we're oriented in Geolocate, let's get down to georeferencing. As you hopefully recall from Module 1, the basic protocol we use for georeferencing specimen records is called the point radius method. This involves finding a point where the specimen is estimated to have been collected, and then assigning an error radius to that point. The error radius represents the area in which we are positive that specimen occurred, even if we aren't as positive about the specific point we have chosen. The larger the error radius, the less certain we are that the specimen was collected exactly at the latitude and longitude that we have assigned. To remember how to use the point radius method, you can use this handy mnemonic. Remember to play your cards right. First, you need to classify the locality description. Then, you assign latitude and longitude coordinates. Next, you add an error radius. Lastly, you document the process you use to georeference the specimen and save your work. Let's go through this step by step. There are many ways that collectors have used to document where they collected their specimens, some more precise than others. We can classify these localities into different types. Rather than go through each of these in detail here, we will refer you to Table 1 in your protocol. This table provides definitions and examples of the locality types, and it explains how you can assign coordinates and an error radius to each type. It is helpful, if not essential, to constantly refer to this table when you are georeferencing. Remember that there are also some types of localities and descriptions that you should not georeference. 
These include very vague locality descriptions, such as a county or a very large city like Los Angeles, or cultivated specimens. Refer to Module 2 for a discussion of identifying cultivated specimens. Once you have decided what type of locality information you are dealing with, use Table 1 to assign appropriate coordinates to the locality text. Let's look back at our example. The locality states 21 miles northwest of Paso Robles on Interlake Road at eastern entrance to B Rock Canyon. This is an example of a specified distance in a direction, path given. According to Table 1, we need to find the center of the starting location and measure the described distance from that center in the correct direction along the given road. Unfortunately, Geolocate does not have the option to measure road miles, that is, distance traveled along a certain route rather than from point A to point B, so it's often best to use Google Maps or another mapping application for this. In another window, open your alternative mapping website and search for the starting location. Find the approximate geographic center of this location, then the road to which the locality description is referring, which can be a little trickier than it seems. Since many specimens were collected 30 to 50 to 100 years ago, place names and road names may have changed, so you might have to do some research about current names. Wikipedia is often a surprisingly good source for such information, but additional resources can be found on our website. In our example, we see Interlake Road approximately 20 miles northwest from Paso Robles, but this road itself doesn't extend all the way to Paso Robles. You can use your best judgment to determine what road is most likely being referenced, unless there is no obvious answer. In this case, we can be fairly certain that this road, Nascimento Lake Drive, is the route to Interlake Road since it is the only road traveling northwest from Paso Robles. To measure a distance between two locations by road in Google Maps, right-click the origin on the map and click Directions from here. Then click elsewhere on the map where you want to end up. The length of the path will be provided on the left. You can then adjust the ending point by clicking and dragging it until it meets the length described in the locality. Right-click and click What's Here to get the latitude and longitude coordinates of this position. To view these coordinates in Geolocate, you can either pan and zoom in the Geolocate window until you've found the location on your map, or you can close Geolocate, paste the latitude and longitude coordinates in their respective fields in the Occurrence Editor, then reopen Geolocate. Just make sure that the green dot you use says Pattern Source Coordinates if you do it this way. When you're assigning coordinates to a locality, you want to use the information on the label that allows you to be as precise as possible. For example, if the name of a city is given, but then also the street or intersection, you want to use the street or intersection to get the most specific point. In our example here, we can try to use the information in addition to the specified distance along a named road. However, you may find that it is difficult to find information about specific canyons, field sites, or other locations. Do some research when necessary, and do your best. We want to be as accurate as possible, since we hope to never have to georeference this specimen again. That being said, if you find that you are spending a long time, like 15 or 20 minutes, to georeference one specimen, and you still aren't totally sure where you should put the point, that might be an indication that you should move on to an easier specimen. You can also use the habitat information to guide you. For instance, you might find that a specimen was collected along a creek, in a sinkhole, on a north-facing slope, or some other topographical feature that could be identified on a map and used to inform your point placement. In this example, we have used the point radius method to travel a certain distance along a certain road. We know that Bee Rock Canyon is in the vicinity, though we're not exactly sure where it is, and we know that it was collected on a north-facing slope. So, we are going to place this point along the specified road and indicate the uncertainty with an appropriate uncertainty radius. This brings us to R in our CARDS mnemonic. Determine the error radius for this specimen's location. To edit the error radius in Geolocate, click the coordinate and select Edit Uncertainty from the bubble. Then you can use the gray handle to grow or shrink the radius. If you don't see the gray handle, it might be that you are zoomed too far in and you'll have to zoom out shrink the radius, and then zoom back in. 
Although the protocol provides guidance on how big this error radius should be, determining an appropriate error radius sometimes seems more like an art than science. In this case, the protocol instructs us to use half the measured distance from the coordinates to the center of the nearest named place. But in order to do this, you need to decide what the nearest named place should be. This is where your own judgment and critical thinking should be used. If the locality information was pretty precise and your selected coordinates match very well with the locality and habitat information, you may be able to use a fairly close named place and thus keep the error radius fairly small. Conversely, if we are less confident in our assignment of coordinates, we may choose a named place that is slightly further away. In our Paso Robles example, because B Rock Canyon was indicated as slightly northeast of my coordinates, but I'm not entirely sure where it was, I'm going to err on the side of caution and place the distance halfway to the further named place, the town of Lake Nacimiento. If your specimen is located in a wilderness area, the nearest town or similarly named place might be a very long way away. Again, use your best judgment to make the error radius appropriately large or small depending on your level of confidence in the precision of that point. You can use things like rivers, streams, and mountains as named places when appropriate. If you find that your error radius is very large, you will want to evaluate again whether you should georeference this specimen at all. Our rule of thumb is to not georeference a specimen if the error radius turns out to be over 8,000 meters but check with the collection you are georeferencing to ensure that they do not have stricter requirements. Now that the coordinates and the error radius are assigned, we can complete the CARDS mnemonic by documenting our georeferencing rationale and saving our work. First, in Geolocate, scroll down and click Save to your application to import the Geolocate coordinates into the Occurrence Editor in CCH2. Next, add your name or username to the georeferenced by field and describe your georeferencing decisions in the georeference remarks field. In this example, we will document what named place we used as our halfway point for the error radius. Last but certainly not least, make sure to save your work. Press enter or scroll down to the bottom of the page and click save edits. We have now georeferenced a specimen from scratch. Note that this process takes some time and will look quite different depending on the locality information that is provided on the specimen label. Make sure to check out all of our georeferencing resources on the Capturing California's Flowers website, including the illustrated version of Table 1, recorded webinars, and a frequently asked questions page that tabulates many common georeferencing questions. And of course, don't hesitate to contact your georeferencing supervisor or the CAP project manager with questions. This brings us to the end of the final module for our georeferencing and CCH2 training course. Thank you for sticking with it to get trained and we hope you're excited to get started.